I'm here to tell you about um, a natural progesterone. Uh, your company makes uh, such a product, and it's very important that you all know what it does. Uh, when I gave this talk in uh, St. Thomas uh, Hospital in uh, London, I started at 9 in the morning, and we had a break for lunch and a tea break at 3 in the afternoon, and I spoke to 5 o'clock to 135 obstetricians and gynecologists, and uh, even that uh, uh, didn't quite cover the subject. This is a much bigger subject than you can imagine, but uh, we're going to try to uh, get across to you uh, not only what progesterone is, but how important this is to the health of women, particularly in industrialized countries, uh, where there is a great uh, confusion among the uh, mainstream uh, the conventional medicine on how to treat women's hormones problems. And so uh, let me tell you just a little bit how I got started with this. I was a family doctor. And for the first 10 years, I was probably a fairly conventional family doctor, trying to do my best. And I may not be the swiftest doctor on the block, but uh, after 10 years, it became obvious to me that it's rather foolish to wait till somebody has their stroke or their heart attack or their diabetes or their fractured hip or whatever. It seemed to be much more wise and much more efficient to try to tell people what to do ahead of time to uh, prevent these things. So I became more and more interested in preventive medicine. And I'm here to tell you, you can't make any money in preventive medicine the way I do it, because I sit and talk to people. And I could never figure out a way to get reimbursed for the time it takes to talk to someone why they shouldn't have their penicillin shot and why instead they should do something about their nutrition and perhaps some supplements to make their immune system stronger. But this is what I found that I enjoyed doing. And in 1976, uh, I started a class at College of Marin, our local junior college, uh, for the um, senior um, uh, students there on a class called Optimal, he Optimal Health, uh, how to stay healthy the, uh, so they don't have to see doctors. Uh, the subtitle, uh, which was never written down but everybody understood, was how to be as healthy as you can be in spite of the AMA and your local doctor. <laughs> and. Uh, this class goes on. I don't know why they let me teach it. I think someday someone in power will figure out what I'm doing and they'll probably stop it. And uh, 76 was also a very important year. I'd been in practice for 20 years. My 40-year-old patients were now 60. My 30-year-old patients were 50. So instead of having all these young patients, I now had older patients. I hadn't changed, but suddenly I had all these older patients. <laughs> and a lot of them had osteoporosis. And this was the crisis. Up until that time, we had been taught that to treat osteoporosis, you should give estrogen, vitamin C, try to get them on a good diet, quit smoking cigarettes, get some exercise. And uh, around 1976, a couple things happened. One was that we had the development of dual photon bone absorptiometry. Bone mineral density tests became a reality. They were not expensive. They are 96% accurate. And we could actually follow people's bones. You didn't have to wait till a fracture occurred to find out they had lousy bones. And this was available to general practitioners like myself. And it became apparent that those people on estrogen were not improving. All you did was slow the bone loss. Estrogen does not uh, reverse osteoporosis. And all these advertisements about estrogen saves so many fractures a year. No, it just delays them a year or two. The only way they could be saved is if you didn't live long enough to get to the next year or two. In other words, if you died, then you were saved the hip fracture that you would have got the next year. <laughs> but you eventually get your hip fracture just a year or two later, that's all. I call that a delay, not a saving. Um, and uh, the other thing that happened was that uh, it became apparent to everybody that a generation of giving estrogen to women was resulting in an increase of endometrial cancer in, in the rate of eight to ten times higher than we had before. This is an unfair thing to women to say, I can give you estrogen for your bones, it won't do much good, and you might get cancer from it, but I'm going to let you decide. You see, the doctors didn't know what to do. If they gave it, they might, the patient might get cancer and then the doctors be sued. And if they didn't get it, the patient might have a fracture and the doctor would be sued. So I went to a CMA meeting, a California Medical Association meeting, to find out what to tell patients. And they said, tell patients they should decide. Then they can't sue you. It has nothing to do with their health. It just has to do with your financial health, that's all. 
And uh, so uh, these two things were going on. And then we knew that there were patients that we had that we couldn't use estrogen on because they had diabetes or vascular disorders, they were obese, or they had uh, gallbladder disease, or they had previous cancer, the breast cancer, cancer of the uterus. Those are all contraindications to using estrogen. So this is a real dilemma. How do you treat the people who have progressive osteoporosis? And osteoporosis in the United States is rampant among women. They lose 20 to 25 percent of their bone mass before menopause. Think of that. We were taught that it's a disease that occurs after menopause, when the estrogen declines. But no, women have plenty of estrogen. They're still having periods, but they get osteoporosis, and they've already lost 20% by the time they get the real menopause. There's something wrong in what I was taught. Then, by serendipity, I heard a talk by a Dr. Ray Pete, who's a biochemist, and he said, at menopause, both hormones, the estrogen and the progesterone, decline, and we only give one back. We only give estrogen back. If you had uh, another gland that uh, was producing hormones and they declined to the point where your body is being harmed by this fall in hormones, you'd give both hormones back. He challenged these. He's a biochemist up in Oregon, teaches, now retired, I think. But he, he challenged the doctors and he said, why are you only giving estrogen back? Mother Nature never, never anticipated unopposed estrogen. It always made both hormones, estrogen and progesterone. And when you give unopposed estrogen, you get all sorts of mischief. All sorts of bad things happen. You should be giving the progesterone. And by the way, he said, the progesterone is available as a cream. It's well absorbed through the skin. Shouldn't be given by mouth. The ovary's smarter than that. The ovary never put its hormones in anybody's mouth <laughs> or stomach. There's a reason for that. It all goes to the liver, and the liver converts it into metabolites ready to be excreted in bile, and these metabolites are no longer the real hormone. It's lost. It's turned into other things, and the other things are toxic in themselves. So if you give big doses of uh, progesterone orally, it ends up as three different metabolites, which are not progesterone, and will be absorbed into brain cells and can cause uh, confusion and uh, depression and all sorts of other things because it's not, not real progesterone anymore. It should go through the skin. There it's absorbed more slowly, just as if the ovary were making it. So I went back to practice and told my patients that uh, uh, they could go get some cream, and I would follow their bones with the bone mineral density tests that we had, and that's when I first started learning about progesterone. Because what these patients showed me in the next three, four, five, ten, twelve years, all the things that progesterone did to help them, the freedom of side effects, lack of any problems at all, and, and recovery from all sorts of other illnesses that no one has ever written about in relation to progesterone. So that by 1993, starting this in 1978, we're talking about, 1993, I was... I felt compelled to write a book about natural progesterone to shorten the learning time for my colleagues so they wouldn't have to take 12, 15 years to learn this. It's not in the books. It's not taught at medical school yet, but it's all true. And instead, my colleagues said, oh, this isn't in the books, so therefore it can't be true. So the patients were driving me to say, write a book for the patients. Write the book so different women, for, for, so women can read about it, because it's women's health we're talking about. My first book I wrote was for my class, Optimal Health Guidelines. And the second book was Natural Progesterone, which is a little 104-page book, all the biochemistry, and to explain the whole thing to my colleagues. I've never had a woman complain about it was too tough. It's full of biochemistry, but women are amazingly intelligent, intuitive, and understanding. But um, I did get requests that the book should be written with more explanation, and um, Warner Books came to me and said, uh, gee, we like your first book. It's got a little bit too much biochemistry, not enough explanation. Would you write a book all explanation without the biochemistry? They don't realize how intelligent the women are. But, uh, but anyway, I did that, along with Virginia Hopkins to help me. And so that came out um, in June, last week in May, actually. And it's in its ninth printing. And we'll be passing 100,000 books, 
probably in a month, and there has been not one nickel spent on advertising this book. This is all word of mouth from woman to woman. Um, this is a graph that shows the uh, bone mineral density of a woman from age 10 to 85. And you will see that um, in her teenage, bone density rises very rapidly. This is due to growth hormone. And then comes puberty, and it continues to rise until the uh, typical woman is 35 years old. Um, and this is due to the progesterone that she's making and her estrogen. And uh, then from age 35 down to 50 or 55, it's declining. Something happens in the United States and other industrialized countries at age 35 on the average in women, sometimes 32, sometimes 36, 38. But the bones start losing bone density even though they have all the estrogen in the world. They're still having periods. That means it's estrogen that causes the periods. So we know it's not estrogen deficiency. So you can see the downward slope of that line, which means that osteoporosis is not due to estrogen deficiency. It's due to something else. But then when you come to 55, you have an acceleration of the downward slope for four or five years. And that's when the estrogen is subsiding at the time of menopause. But the estrogen doesn't go to zero. It only drops about 40%, just so that the woman doesn't have periods anymore. But during this time of drop, there is a slight acceleration of bone loss. But the body compensates for that in about five years. And then from then on, the decline in bone density is the same as it was before menopause. So I hope you can see that, because that, that curve. This is from a textbook. This is not my curve. Uh, this shows me that there's something else going on. Okay, at the top left, uh, that's what I call the Pac-Man. You know the Pac-Man game where little things go around and gobble up other creatures? Well, those little things are osteoclasts. Those are bone cells that migrate around through little tiny channels in your bones, and they will find bone that's been made four, five, six, seven years ago that's becoming too crystallized, too likely to, to uh, more fragile, more likely to fracture. And they, uh, they can uh, move in there and actually dissolve away the bone. They actually, uh, it's called resorption. There's nothing left. They leave behind a space. The minerals get released back into the bloodstream. The uh, connective tissue part of the bone, the collagen fibers get dissolved, and a little empty space is left there, and it's called a lacuna, a little lake, a little open space. And immediately on the heels of the osteoclasts come the osteoblasts, and uh, they move in and they make new bone that has been cleared out by the... Uh, where the old bone has been cleared out by the osteoclasts. So the osteoclasts are always going around finding old bone to remove, and the osteoblasts move in and make new bone. Your bone is always being made new, just like your hair, just like your fingernails, your toenails, your skin, the lining of all the epithelial structures in your body, the glandular structures, everything except brain cells and muscle cells are always being remade. Red blood cells, white cells, everything you can think of. And so are bones. That's why bones can heal. That's why bones can change shape. They can grow with you. And this is why they can renew themselves. It turns out that the effect of estrogen is to slow up the osteoclasts so the bone resorption isn't too fast. And the effect of progesterone is to stimulate the osteoblasts to make new bone. So the resulting mass, the resulting bone mass, is like a bank account. It depends how much is being put in and how much is being taken out. So that... Um, what doctors have been doing by giving estrogen is trying to slow the rate at which it's being taken out, but they're doing nothing to increase the rate at which new bone is being made, and that's the problem. Okay. This is a um, photo micrograph uh, showing this. It shows that this is not just somebody's idea. You can actually see there are four little black triangles that outline a place where the new bone has been made. And this can actually be seen under a microscope. And this is happening all the time. And it's called a turnover rate, the time at which it takes for 100% of a given bone to be remade so that every single molecule, every single mineral, every single bit of collagen has been made all over again. It's called the turnover time. The turnover time for a trabecular bone, like in your back, is four to five years. The turnover time for the hard bone of your arms and your legs is about 14 years. 
So when I was uh, doing these bone mineral density tests, I always used the lumbar spine because I didn't want to wait 12 to 10 or 15 years to see what the result was. I wanted to see what the result was in two or three years. And what happened to my patients when I treated them, if you don't treat them, they were losing 1.5% of bone mass a year. If you treated them with estrogen, you could hold it stable for a few years, and then it would go down. And if you use progesterone cream, they gained 15% new bone on average uh, in three years. Such a thing has never been reported before, and yet it's standard. You must realize that bone building involves other factors, the right calcium, the right diet, the right pH of the stomach, or lack of antibiotics, not overuse of antibiotics, and no overuse of diuretics like Lasix. There are many other factors. But once you get all those factors in gear, and then you add the progesterone, you get new bone. And it doesn't matter what age the patient is. It doesn't matter practically anything else. The progesterone will stimulate new bone formation. Okay. Um, oh, this shows an example of uh, somebody's uh, bone. This was uh, from this is a lady from the class that I, I taught. Um, for people who took my class at the college, the rule was that uh, if they took my class, they couldn't be my patient because I didn't want anybody saying I'm teaching the class in order to try to attract business. My my practice was too big as it was, so uh, I could look good w without losing anything by uh, saying that they couldn't be my patient. Well, this was a lady in my class whose husband was dying of um, cancer, and she tried to lift him off the floor one time when she, he fell, and uh, she broke her arm. And she was found to have quite severe osteoporosis, and she went to a doctor, and uh, he sent her to a specialist who said, uh, well, this is bad osteoporosis, you have to have fluoride. And she said, no, I took Dr. Lee's class, and we know that fluoride is not good for bone. It might, it might make the x-ray picture look a little stronger, but the bones are not stronger. And he said, well, if you're not going to take my treatment, go see Dr. Lee. You see, that made it a referral. <laughs> so it was OK. <laughs> So she came, and uh, we gave her the progesterone. And as you can see from the progressive bars, they were uh, eight to nine months apart. And you can see that she gained about 22%, 24% new bone within about two years. And she's continued to gain bone. She's, uh, she was about 72 or 74 when I first saw her. And this was, she's now up about 86, 87. She still lives in her house. Her husband has died. She still does her gardening. She still does her walking. She recently drove up to Canada to see her elderly, her younger sister, who has Alzheimer's disease. And, uh, but at any rate, uh, this shows what can be done. And all that was done was to add, she well, already was on a good diet. All we did was add the progesterone cream. Uh, people said, um, uh, well, John, she probably had a little compression fracture. And the reason the uh, back x-rays and the back bone mineral density test got better was because a little compression fracture healed, and there was more uh, calcium in that healed. But they didn't know I had taken all four of the lumbar spines, L1, L2, L3, L4. And each one uh, increased at the same rate. So it was a, a general increase of all the bones, and it wasn't due to recovery from a, a lumbar fracture. And uh, this is a lady 10 years later from uh, Pennsylvania who uh, woke up one morning with a terrible pain. And uh, she is also about the same age, about 74 or 72. She'd been a health nut. She always took all her supplements, ate well, looked great. Um, she looked about 52, and she was really 72, but she wasn't on progesterone. She'd been 30 years from menopause, and she'd been 30 years without any progesterone, and her bones could not keep up with the loss. And she had terrible osteoporosis. So she, uh, I'd met her at a conference in Washington, D.C. about uh, five years before. She'd heard about this, and I sent her a copy of my papers that I'd written about it. And her husband's a doctor, and her son's a doctor, and of course she had a doctor, and then he got her a bone doctor, and then she had a radiologist too. So she told them all, she told them all that she was going to use this progesterone cream, and they said, oh, you can, it's crazy. You can't get uh, hormones out of uh, plants, you know. And uh, and then we had to explain to the doctors that all the hormones they use have come from the plants. They've been synthesized from the fats in the plants, and that's where all the cortisone and even digitalis comes from, which comes from a plant directly, as far as that goes. But, but at any rate, um, then they said, well, you can't absorb it through the skin. These are the same doctors that give estroderm patches. <laughs> you know. so, so you have a hard time being kind 
to the doctors to try to explain something like that. So, but she's very stubborn, and she did it. And her husband, the doctor, made her get a, a repeat test every eight months. And in 16 months, she gained 22% more bone. And in about two months, her pain was gone, you know. So, so I got a very nice letter from her husband who said, if I hadn't seen it with my own eyes, I wouldn't have believed it. I got a nice letter from the radiologist, said he's never seen anything like this before. I haven't got a letter from her son. You see, he's closer to graduation time from medical school and can't quite think straight yet, you see. <laughs> this is a list of 63 or 62 patients, and the white bars are the patients' bone mineral densities when I first saw them, and the empty bars are where they were three years later. And you'll see that there's two or three that did not improve, and that means there are other factors involved. One of them I discovered was uh, one lady of 70s uh, was not making enough hydrochloric acid so she couldn't absorb the calcium. And uh, when we corrected that, then her bones took off. Another lady had become depressed from the loss of her husband, was sitting at home drinking tea and smoking cigarettes and not eating. And so we got her into grief therapy counseling and she got over that and then when she added the food back, then her bones took off again. So, but you'll see every one of those uh, is pretty damn good. Uh, if this is a placebo effect, it's a damn good placebo effect. <laughs> and um, because there are still uh, colleagues of mine who say that progesterone has nothing to do with bones. And, um, but uh, there it is. Uh, I don't know what to say. This just shows the various factors, um, the various minerals. There's a lot of confusion among my uh, in my class about where minerals come from. And um, I have to point out to them that the minerals are in the dirt. They're in the soil of the earth. And the only creature that can put them into an organic, edible form for us is a plant. That's where minerals come from. And unfortunately, a lot of the, the plant food that people eat has been overcooked and the minerals have been lost, or the soil is undernourished and the, and the minerals aren't there. And uh, so uh, we do have mineral deficiencies, and uh, we have to follow that. And then there are all these other factors uh, p doctors give Lasix, furosemide, as a diuretic to all these little old ladies. When Lasix was first developed, it was sold as a treatment for parathyroid disorder because its main function is that it causes you to pee out calcium. So all these little ladies are taking furosemide or Lasix, and they're all losing calcium. So then the doctor gives them more estrogen. The estrogen causes water retention. So then they get more Lasix and then more estrogen, and then they die of one or the other. It's crazy. And there are these other factors, and these are uh, other things. Fluoride is a factor for bad bones, and uh, the regular diuretics are not, uh, they're, they are also related to increased fracture risk. Not because, uh, like hydrochlorothiazide, not because you lose calcium, but because the 80-year-old uh, lady is forced to get up at 1.30 or 3.30 in the morning when she's still groggy because she has to uh, urinate and she falls into the tub or on the tile floor or something and breaks her hip. So uh, getting two or three hours sleep when you're 80 years old and then having to go to the bathroom is not wise. We're going to go through these. These are the things you probably all know. Uh, the various minerals, um, everything from strontium to silica to zinc and uh, uh, manganese and magnesium and, uh, of course, calcium and the vitamins. Uh, and uh, at first I thought I could just get people to eat a, a good diet. And then I realized uh, this is the hardest part. This is the hardest part. Everybody thinks they know what a good diet is. And um, they, they all agree that other people don't know, but they know. And so it's very difficult to change. So I, I have consented to add more supplements as the time goes on. And I give magnesium and B6 and and vitamin C and beta carotene and zinc, and uh, it helps them as they work their way into getting a better diet. Uh, to explain progesterone is not as simple as, uh, you, as it might seem. Progesterone is a very unique uh, hormone, very unique compound. We make it out of cholesterol. Every cell in your body has mitochondria, and you can make cholesterol out of fats, but mostly you make it out of sugars and starches. You do not make it out of cholesterol. Ford Motor Company doesn't make Fords by buying Fords and pushing them through an empty factory. You make it out of parts, and the parts are starches. 
little two and three carbon fragments from starches we put together to make the cholesterol molecule. Because we need the cholesterol. We need the cholesterol not only for cell membranes for, and for fat storage and energy and insulation, but we need it also as the base from which we make all our hormones. And the first hormone that's made is um, the pregnenolone, uh, which is made by the mitochondria, never gets out of the cell. It's instantly picked up by the follicle in the ovary or the, or the uh, adrenal glands or uh, brain cells, and um, the body turns it directly into progesterone. And then once it's made progesterone, then it can make all the rest of the hormones from that. So all the testosterone, all the estrogens, and all the corticosterone come from the progesterone. Progesterone is the mother hormone. Interesting thing is, it's a hormone in its own right. It has all these wonderful benefits. It is absolutely necessary for a fertilized egg to survive, become an embryo, for that embryo to develop all through nine months of gestation and come out as a healthy baby. At every step along the way, progesterone is an absolute necessity. If progesterone is low, you lose. The baby is lost. It's as simple as that. And because of that importance for it's the, it's the hormone that promotes gestation, and that's how it got its name, progesterone. That means the hormone that, produ that produces gestation and develops the baby. So it's necessary for that. It, it creates an environment in the uterus so that the fertilized egg can uh, find uh, a home there and can get nourishment. The estrogen role is to build up the bloody lining. Progesterone is to convert it into a lining that the fertilized egg can uh, survive on. And this is so important. So that's the procreation. It also is the, co it is the uh, precursor for all the other hormones. You'd think that would be enough, but I could make a list of 30, 40, 60 different other actions that progesterone has, and we don't even know the mechanism. It helps the thyroid hormone to work. It's picked up by brain cells and allows you to focus and concentrate better. It reduces cell excitability, so it's a treatment for epilepsy. Isn't that amazing? In the 40s, it was the recommended treatment for epilepsy. It's uh, fantastic. It helps you burn fat for fuel, just like in males the testosterone does. It has no effect on your sex characteristics. It does nothing for breasts. doesn't make anybody feminized. Babies go through nine months of being bathed in progesterone, and the boy babies come out as boys, and the girl babies come out as girls. There is no sexual change whatsoever. In fact, men make, make uh, progesterone out of cholesterol, and men need it in order to make testosterone and sperm. And there is a male menopause. It happens about my age, about 67. Progesterone falls, estradiol rises, and the testosterone is converted into dihydrotestosterone. And for some reason, conventional medicine thinks that benign prostate hypertrophy and prostate uh, cancer come from too much testosterone. If that were the case, it would, these things would occur when you're 20 years old. That's when your testosterone is raging high. Some of you haven't forgotten. Why does it happen when you're 75 years old and your testosterone is down on the floor? I don't understand conventional medicine much anymore. Their thinking seems to have these big gaps in it, and they're going around castrating all these men to reduce the testosterone to zero. It's already close to zero. But they're leaving uh, the, uh, the lack of progesterone and the excess of estradiol and that may be the cause of the oxidation reactions that occur in these cells in the prostate that end up causing the prostate problems in the first place, and the testosterone may have prevented that. So here you have this amazing molecule. Three major functions I want you to remember. One is the uh, procreation. You cannot have babies without progesterone. The second is that it is the precursor for all the other hormones, all the other steroid hormones. And the third thing is that it has hundreds of other beneficial effects throughout the body. Helps the immune mechanism. Um, it helps, it's thermogenic, it raises your temperature a little bit. And if you don't have it, then you mimic hypothyroidism. And your doctor will think you're hypothyroid because your morning temperature is down and you have no energy. And he'll give you thyroid medicine even though your thyroid tests are normal. He thinks his clinical judgment is so damn good. 
that he can, he can go against the uh, lab test. No, he's missing out that you're low in progesterone. If you give progesterone, your temperature comes up, your energy level comes up, just as if uh, that was what you needed. In fact, that was. The Catholic Church knows that it brings your temperature up. That's how they do the, uh, um, uh, the rhythm method. You measure your, your, your temperature and you know when you ovulate, because you only make the progesterone when you ovulate, and that's when your temperature comes up half a degree. Uh, the slides will show that progesterone molecule is synthesized in us by, uh, from cholesterol. And in 1936, there was a great um, scurrying around by scientists to find natural sources for progesterone. But it turns out that like cholesterol, progesterone is not made by plants. To get the progesterone in 1935, you could take the ovaries out of women and squeeze them and get a little drop of progesterone out. You'd have to do this to a thousand women to get the amount that's in one jar of cream. Well, women didn't sit still for that. <laughs> so then they tried it with pigs, pregnant pigs. And if you did it to a thousand pregnant pigs, you could get a little, little progesterone that you could put in a jar but it wasn't commercially successful. And in France, they tried getting it from the placenta. You know, when you're pregnant, not only does the ovary make a progesterone, but the, but the placenta itself makes progesterone. And instead of 15 milligrams a day, you, the placenta makes 300 milligrams a day, 20 times higher than the ovary ever made. Can you imagine the safety factor? If you were to multiply the amount of water you drink by 300 times, you'd die. The salt, the thyroid, anything. The safety factor in thyroid is un I mean, in progesterone is unbelievable. During the regular month, the woman makes 15, maybe 20 at most, milligrams a day. But during pregnancy, she can make 300, 350 milligrams. And most hormones are not made in milligram amounts. They're made in microgram amounts, a thousand times less. This is the major hormone in your body. And it's not being given back to women when they lose it. Now, why, why do they lose it? Oh, the scientists found that um, they could extract fats and oils from plants. Saponins, you know, sap, saponins in plants, many of them are very similar to cholesterol and to progesterone. And Dr. Russell E. Marker, in 1936, a professor at the University of Pittsburgh, I think, or Pennsylvania, he found a three-step chemical process that could convert those fats into real, honest-to-God, natural hormone, natural progesterone. We call it natural because it is identical to the human. It's natural to humans. The source is not important. To me, it doesn't matter if they start with acorns or dandelions or ferns or anything else they want. If they can get that oil, which is common in Mexican wild yam, abundant, they're greasy big things, loaded with it, and it's common in the soy, and it's common in 5,000 different plants. They take that oil, they can, be, they can convert it into real uh, natural progesterone. So that's been the source now for 60 years. You all know it. All the biochemists know it. Most of the people who run the health food stores know it. The only people who don't know it are the doctors of my acquaintance. They can't figure that out. They say, oh, John, it's been synthesized. I say, yeah, just like we synthesize it uh, from cholesterol. These scientists are synthesizing it from a similar fat. We synthesize our hair. You don't have to eat hair. We synthesize toenails, eyeballs, teeth. You don't have to eat those things. We make them. And if you make them using a scientific method, it's still being synthesized. We use biochemistry. The scientists use biochemistry. As long as it's the same product at the end, it's the same product. That's the beauty of biochemistry. If you have that molecule, that's the one it is. And this is the molecule of progesterone. I put it on the cover so my doctor friends would get the idea that this is what I'm talking about. <laughs> if it's some other molecule, then it's not progesterone. You see, it's not difficult. This is not the atomic, uh, this is not nuclear science. This is, this is very strange. Now the question that I want to address you, uh, ask you about is, 
Why do you suppose it is that the women of this century are running out of progesterone when they're 35 years old? We didn't have a good answer for that 12, 15 years ago. We thought maybe it was stress, bad diet, poor nutrition, but nobody had ever showed the exact steps of how that comes about. And then we had the evidence from the die-off of different wildlife populations. The alligators in Lake Apopka, Florida, the Florida cougar, the turtles, the frogs, the peregrine falcon, the, um, the whales in the St. Lawrence, the beluga whales in the St. Lawrence uh, River, the fish in uh, the Great Lakes, the salmon in Scotland, and the undescended testes and the damage, obvious damage to little boys being born in Denmark. It was all over the industrialized world that animals were having trouble repopulating. And the scientists uh, that were called in to study these animals all found the same thing. The ovaries of these animals, whether it's birds or reptiles or fish or the alligators or the deer or the cougar, the ovaries are large, but the follicles where the eggs come from uh, were damaged. They had dysfunctional follicles. And in the males, the testes were, were reduced in size, atrophied, and the Sertoli cells that make the testosterone were damaged. Now, when are these structures made? They are made in day 14 to 17 of your embryo life. Something is getting into your mom when she's pregnant with you. And the ovaries are being put together during those days, and the testicles in the males. And they're being put together wrong. And in all of these animal populations, the thing that caused it was pollution, environmental pollution by petrochemical substances, mostly insecticides and pesticides, but any petrochemical substance, or many of them, thousands we now know, that have a very, very potent effect on the development of those tissues during embryo life. You can give DDT to the grown-ups, and the grown-ups do not die from that. They don't even appear to get sick from it. But if they were pregnant at the time, the baby will be affected, but it won't be observable at the time of birth. The baby will look fine. But when the baby grows up to be 32 years old, she will run out of follicles. She still makes estrogen, but she's run out of follicles and she can't make it. She's chugging along on all this estrogen. She has unopposed estrogen until the next, for the next 12, 15 years until she goes through menopause. And even then she has unopposed estrogen because estrogen doesn't fall to zero. But the progesterone has fallen to zero. You see what's happened? The doctors who found all this were brought together by Dr. Theo Coburn, a PhD, who works for Wildlife Center in East Coast. And they have written a book called Our Stolen Future. It gives you all the evidence of this ongoing poisoning of our environment by petrochemical products that is now showing up in women as progesterone deficiency. But you see, it's always one generation ahead. The poisoning that's going on now will not be observable till 35 years from now. If you take the fall in, in uh, testosterone and sperm in men, older men, like 40, 45, 50, <laughs> some people think it's older, <laughs> it's younger for me, but, but if you take the sperm count in these older people who've lived in these areas and their moms were living there when they were in the womb, their sperm count is falling, and if you graph that out, the falling sperm count will hit zero two generations from now. It may be that the last ch a male child to father a baby in the United States, the last male to father a baby in the United States may already have been born. Think about it. And the women are the ones that are showing the effect of this because they need the progesterone. Now, let me tell you what happened in the last... Um, Anyway, in my practice, I learned that the fibrocystic breast turned back to normal, losing scalp hair turned back to normal, thyroid problems turned back to normal, uh, weight loss problems turned back to normal. I could help people get pregnant because when they ovulate, I could give them progesterone, and then that would make the fertilized egg survive, and they could stay on it right through uh, period. Uh, edema problems went away. Allergies went away. I have ladies that call me from the Safeway store, 
and they realize, they walk through the uh, counter where the uh, Sinotabs and the decongestants are, and they realize that now since they've been on progesterone, they don't have to buy those anymore. It's amazing, all this, none of it is in the books. So I wrote about it, so I tried to tell people about it. But the last week, let me get to this. You see, there's always people who say, John, the synthetic progestins like Provera and Megastrol and all the ones that are in the birth control pills, they're really progesterone too. They're just a little different. They're made a little different. And uh, so they, they say it's the same thing. And I say, no, they are not. Progesterone is only this. That's, that's all. Anything else is not progesterone. All the biochemistry books support me in this. So I don't have any argument with the experts. I have arguments with my fellow doctors about this. Well, last week, or a couple of months ago now, the British Journal of Cancer re reported the results of a 20-year study, a 20-year study in which the three major hospitals in London, every woman who was having breast cancer surgery had her hormone levels tested at the time of surgery. And they've been collecting all this information now for 20 years. They've now put it all together and I'm going to show you a graph. One line, these are all women who had breast cancer surgery that were node positive. They already had cancer that had spread from the breast into nodes up in the adjacent area, up in the axilla, and so on. These are node positive cancer, breast cancer people who had mastectomy. And this graph shows what happens if your progesterone level was normal at the time of surgery or if your progesterone was low at the time of surgery. I don't know if you can see this or not. The top line shows that the survival rate at 18 years of people that had normal progesterone is approximately 75, 70 percent at 18 years. The survival rate of the people who had low progesterone 18, at the time of surgery, the survival rate 18 years later is down around 30 percent. This is a 100 percent difference. Just from the difference in the progesterone level and nothing else, at the time of surgery. Imagine what this line would be if you had women who were given good progesterone all the way along. When I first started giving progesterone, I gave it to people who had had breast cancer, couldn't take estrogen. People who had endometrial cancer, couldn't take estrogen. Now in 18, 19 years now that I've been doing this, not one of these people has ever died of breast cancer or cancer of the uterus. Wow. Right. Now the final thing is uh, I've been sitting on this study since December. It's marked confidential, okay? Um, but now I can tell you about it because it is this week published in a journal called Nature Medicine. This is the problem these scientists, these were scientists up at the Oregon Regional Primate Research Center in Beaverton, Oregon. They got a grant from the National Institutes of Health. The problem they were to address is why is it that women rarely have a fatal heart attack before menopause and 10 years after menopause their heart attack rate fatality matches men's. Y'all follow that? Y'all know that probably already. The heart attack, the, the fatalities from heart attack rate is the number one cause of death in women after menopause. And the rate at which women are dying from heart attacks is essentially identical to men, where it's also number one. Prior to menopause, it didn't happen. So that's one fact that's a given. The second fact is that when you do autopsies on these women who die of their heart attacks, you find that their coronary arteries are not clogged very much with any cholesterol crap. In men, they die because the whole coronary artery gets filled up. That's why they like to do coronary angioplasty and coronary bypass, is to try to get the blood past the total blockage. But in these women, the blockage universally is less than 50%, which should not be fatal. So the reasoning is that our coronary arteries are never the same size. They're always adjusting for need, and sometimes they go into spasm. When they go into spasm, then a 50% occlusion becomes a 100% occlusion. You all see that? Okay. So they looked to see 
what, where can we find an animal model to check the effect of the hormones on the vasospasm of the coronary arteries? Turns out the pig heart, which is the customary heart used in conventional medicine, the coronary arteries of the pig heart never go into spasm. So it's the wrong animal to choose. They can't make the arteries go into spasm. Ours will go into spasm if we get a letter from the Internal Revenue Service. The pig doesn't care. The pig doesn't have to climb trees and hang by his tail. It doesn't have to adjust for different gravitational forces and, and uh, the mo motion of the blood. But the monkey heart does. The rhesus monkey. And that's why they chose these people here up in Oregon. They were experts at doing angiograms, coronary angiograms on rhesus monkeys. So this is what they did. They got the angiograms going. They got pictures of them here. And uh, showed that they could turn on a spasm of the coronary artery by giving a little uh, platelet antibody. Um, and then, if necessary, if the spasm wouldn't relent, they could give something like nitroglycerin and uh, open it up again. So they put these uh, monkeys on low-dose estrogen, like our women are in HRT, only our, the conventional medicine is usually high-dose estrogen, which may make it worse. But anyway, these monkeys were put on estrogen and found the coronary spasm went just as before. There was no change from that. Then they added Provera to the mix. Provera is medroxyprogesterone acetate, the most commonly used synthetic progestin. Okay? When they added Provera, the artery went into spasm and would not relent. The monkeys would die if the scientists hadn't given nitroglycerin to open them up again. Six out of six monkeys, every single time, the arteries would go into spasm. And if those arteries had any occlusion, it would become a 100% occlusion. You follow that? So then they did another six monkeys on estrogen, only this time they added natural progesterone. And I like it because they added it in doses that are the same as I recommend, the same as women would take 15 or 20 milligrams a day for a, a normal-sized woman, which is easy to get in these creams. They're well absorbed through the skin. And guess what happened? They couldn't create the spasm. The arteries won't go into spasm if you have natural progesterone on board. Imagine the difference between the, the synthetic progestin and the natural progesterone. The synthetic one caused the spasm that wouldn't relent, and the natural progesterone prevented zero out of six monkeys. They tried it on six different monkeys and couldn't get the uh, coronary artery to spasm on any of them if they had nice dose of natural progesterone on board. So here we have not only a great distinction between the real progesterone and the synthetic, but the distinction happens to be life-saving on top of it. So here we have the evidence now from London that progesterone will protect you from dying of breast cancer. It doubled the survival time 18 years later just from the progesterone level at the time of your surgery. If any breast cancer cells got into your system and progesterone was there at the time, it would stop them from growing and killing you then. Isn't that something? And if we could do that to women throughout their time after uh, menopause to make sure their progesterone levels are normal. And by the way, the blood tests are not good. You have to do saliva tests. You see, when the ovary makes the hormone, it wraps it in a protein, so the excess will go swept up by the blood and go to the liver, where it be unwrapped and converted into a, a metabolites that will be excreted in bile. It was just a way of sending it to the liver by making it soluble in the blood. When you take the progesterone cream, it goes through the skin and uh, into the fat, and then it's picked up by capillaries over a slow process during the day, just as if the ovary were making it, but it's not bound in protein. It's not wrapped in that protein envelope, that cortisol binding globulin envelope. So it doesn't ride in the serum anymore. The serum is watery, and the fat-soluble compounds won't ride in a watery milieu. 
So they ride around on red blood cell membranes and chylomicrons and fatty things that are in the blood. But the saliva contains mucin, and mucin picks those things up. The real active, biologically active hormone, fat soluble, will be picked up by the mucin in saliva, and the saliva then will reflect the amount of active hormone in the bloodstream. That's the important measurement. The World Health Organization has switched over to uh, saliva hormone assays rather than serum assays for that reason. And they're also cheaper, they also last longer, they, 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 don't, they can be handled more roughly and uh, stay, uh, stay accurate longer. So they're not only cheaper, they're more accurate, but they're more relevant. They are measuring the active hormone, not just the hormone being sent to, to the liver to be excreted. These things are now solid, uh, that we can protect women against uh, estrogen-induced uh, uh, cancer. We can protect people from dying of their breast cancer, their endometrial cancer. Oh, and now their ovarian cancer. A huge study by Emory University published uh, last summer by Johns Hopkins, uh, uh, the American Journal of Epidemiology. A study of over 240,000 women, almost a quarter million new women, followed for eight years to see who is dying from cancer of the ovary. You have to have a large group because cancer of the ovary is not a common disease. And in that group, they had several hundred over the eight years that had fatal ovarian cancer. And guess what? They were the women who were on unopposed estrogen. Wow. I mean, the evidence is so strong. Breast cancer, cancer of the uterus, uh, cancer of the ovary, and now we have heart disease. What are they waiting for? I mean, if we get all the, uh, the women will have to commit suicide to die if we get them on progesterone. But, <laughs> but they won't do that because progesterone is the one that restores libido. Isn't that something? Everybody thinks estrogen is what causes libido. It doesn't. It's either testosterone or progesterone. They're the ones that do that. So there's this great learning that has to occur. And I'm counting on the network, such as yourself, and the women of the world in general. The women of the world network, they have an informal information system that is going to carry this message around. And people like yourself who have the product to sell, you get the message right. You will not have a problem. You see, I am not against getting the right amount of estrogen into people. But estrogen deficiency is not the problem. It's progesterone deficiency. And it's not due to Mother Nature making a mistake. Mother Nature did not make the mistake with women. Mother Nature did a beautiful job with women. It's mankind that has messed with the uh, hormones because of the, bio, uh, the petrochemical pollution that is affecting the embryos that our women are carrying. And we won't see the result till a full generation. We're a generation behind. So we see this happening. So, um, so at any rate, I applaud your efforts to uh, um, uh, have a good progesterone product and uh, to understand what there is to know about the progesterone. I encourage people to uh, read my book so that they will know about it. And uh, actually, the book is fine as it is, but the Warner people who insisted on that title, what your doctor may not tell you about menopause, suddenly realized that women who are not in menopause are passing by the book. So the next one is going to be uh, about the progesterone and premenopause. It'll be the same book. <laughs> <laughs> Slightly altered so that uh, the premenopausal woman will understand that we're talking about her too. Because this starts early. This starts uh, early 30s. Uh, so if we, uh, I want to thank you for your attention. And maybe we can have time for a question or two. Thank you. Yes, I wanted to know if the efficacy of natural progesterone is changed or altered by also taking um, HRT yeah, wonder, at the same yeah, time. Yeah, good question. Um, the, uh, the synthetic progestins, like in HRT, the Provera, the Megastrol, or in the birth control pills, are totally foreign to your body. 
They're foreign to every form of life in, on the planet. And this is why they can be patented. You cannot patent a natural compound. You cannot patent progesterone. You cannot patent estradiol. But you can patent these damn foreign things that are foreign to your body. And being foreign, you cannot metabolize them out of the receptor sites very well. All these hormones work by combining with receptors. The receptors are made for the progesterone, but these foreigners get in there and they cannot be metabolized out. These foreign ones are three to 20 times more tenacious at the receptor sites. So you could take all the progesterone you wanted and float around your bloodstream until it's finally metabolized out through the liver and it would never get a chance to combine with the receptor site. So the answer is you can do it, but it will do you no good. You have to get rid of the damned uh, synthetic progestins. There's not one good synthetic progestin ever made. The, the right one has been made by Mother Nature, and man has been smart enough to learn how to make it from fats and oils and plants. And it, that is the product, that is the molecule. That when you are progesterone deficient and estrogen dominant, your body tries to save your poor life by cutting down the sensitivity of the estrogen receptors. It's trying to say, this woman is estrogen dominant, unopposed. We've got to do something to block all this estrogen effect. So the receptors are tuned down. They are not very receptive and, re and reactive to the estrogen. As soon as you start the progesterone, Mother Nature or the sense of the body says, my God, her ovaries have started up again. Now we'll activate the estrogen receptors because now there's some progesterone around. So now she gets all these estrogen reactions. As soon as she starts the progesterone, she gets edema, swelling of water, flush, her face swells up, she can't sleep, uh, she uh, has sinus congestion, uh, she sometimes gets rapid palpitation in the heart. This is all due to the estrogen. So every time I add progesterone to a woman already on estrogen of any sort, I insist that they cut their estrogen dose in half. And then two months later, cut that in half. And two months later, cut that in half until you get down to the dose that's necessary to prevent hot flashes or vaginal dryness. And lo and behold, the typical woman after menopause needs no estrogen at all. She just has to reduce it gradually that way. But if she does, her body will tell her. Right. The lab tests are not going to tell her the body will. At what age do you recommend someone using the progesterone? Aha. Uh -huh. What age do I recommend someone using? Well, once you read the book and get the idea of what estrogen dominance is like, you can see it in the women at the, going through the, the food store. Uh, you don't need to be a rocket scientist here, you can tell. So if you have, say a woman's doing fine, her weight is 125 pounds, she has a lot of energy, uh, and then she gets to be 30, 35 years old, she's suddenly getting fat around her butt and her thighs and her lower abdomen, and she exercises uh, and uh, nothing happens, she can't lose any weight, and she's tired all the time, and she's lost interest in sex, her marriage is going to hell. She knows something is happening. <laughs> she knows something is happening, and she goes to the doctor, and he says, my dear, you may be approaching menopause, I'm going to give you estrogen. Whoa, and when that doesn't work, he says, I guess I didn't give you enough. And when that causes excess bleeding and hyperplasia that he proves by doing a DNC, he says hyperplasia is the first step on the way to get cancer. You're scheduled for your hysterectomy next Tuesday. And this is the way they're railroaded into that, and it's crazy. So I, the age that I am worried about is the middle 30s. If a woman has irregular periods, uh, painful periods, um, and she's 18 years old or 19 years old, the first step is to correct her diet. Get her off the Coca-Colas, get her off the Pepsis, get her off the sugar, the white flour, get her off the animal products that are loaded with estrogen, get her off the red meat, get her off the milk. Those are products from animals that are loaded with animal estrogens. So I do that change. Get her on exercise. Find out if there's some stress going on. I hesitate to monkey with a woman's hormones when she's that young. If nothing works, then I do a saliva test to see if the hormones really are off. And if she is deficient in progesterone, she's not ovulating, and I've done everything I can, then I would give that woman some progesterone. And I would do it at the time of the month when the ovary should have already ovulated. I don't want to stop the occasional ovulation that might occur. I want to give her every chance to have a baby. So I go from day 14 to day 26. So that's... Uh, 
way I do it. And you oh. shoot for 15 or 20 milligrams a day, and anyone can calculate. Anyone who can make a cake from scratch can figure out that if you need 20 milligrams a day for 24 days, you need 480 milligrams for the whole month. That's not tough. And if the cream contains 480 milligrams per ounce or per half ounce or whatever it is, use that amount. It can be done. The doctor will say, I don't know how to dose this uh, cream. How, it's a jar full. I don't know how to dose it. And I tell him, don't worry. Your patient is a woman. <laughs> the woman will figure this out. <laughs> so, one more? Yeah, here we are. Could you please reiterate again the, uh, the role of uh, testosterone, and particularly men with, with, with prostate cancer, right. and maybe the use of uh, natural progesterone cream and or DHEA, right. pro or con? Okay, I'll give you my take on that. Um, when I read biochemical uh, reports that in older men, testosterone um, is converted into uh, um, dihydrotestosterone. Remember O5-alpha reductase? Yep. Turns out we can do saw palmetto berry extract, and that helps to correct that problem. And they also have a low progesterone level and a rising estradiol level. If you watch the television on Sunday afternoons on the seniors golf tournament, and you see these 70-year-old guys going down the land of fairway wearing just a t-shirt, you can see the breast wobble. They've got estradiol going. And uh, so they're at that, it's been my idea that the whole problem is this shift of all the hormones. It isn't just the testosterone. So I give the people saw palmetto berry extract. I give the people progesterone. I get them off of high estrogen foods like red meat and milk. They're on a plant-based diet. And lo and behold, their prostate symptoms get better. Their, their uh, 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 prostate-specific antigen, their PSA test, that returns to normal. Uh, the little lesions that they saw on the ultrasound of their uh, prostate scan uh, fade away. And two years later, you can't find them. I'm not saying I'm curing cancer. I'm saying the body is back in charge. And that's what's happening. So this is why I hope somebody will do a research project on this. It's desperately needed. The testosterone ablation therapy does not work. It does not change the death rate of people who are being treated with the prostate cancer. Isn't that amazing? So maybe I've latched on to something. I don't know. But I know that I have patients from eight years ago when I retired that are doing fine, and they've never had their testicles removed. They've never had their prostate removed. They've never had Lupron. Uh, they're doing fine. They're not going to change. Now there's a club formed of men who are in my class, and they're all doing it, driving their doctors crazy. <laughs> and uh, so that's the, that's the benefit. It's the precursor for testosterone in men. And when it cannot work to make the right testosterone, you can add progesterone. It does not hurt men. I first started using it on men who'd already had been, uh, been castrated. And if their testosterone is gone and they don't have progesterone, within two years they'll have rampant osteoporosis. So I put them on progesterone because if I put them on testosterone, their doctors would get very upset because that was the reason for castrating them. So I put them on progesterone. The doctor doesn't know what it does, so uh, nobody gets upset, but they both help the bones. <laughs> right. Okay. That's it. Thank you.